Yes, we're at Don Cherry's Grapevine, and again, we're going to have Dick Irvin on. I'll tell you one thing, boy, him and Danny were the greatest of all of all time. They were on, just going, it was like a, a poetry in motion. They were so great. And, uh, you know, Dick's dad was a great coach. I mean, I, and I mean great. He, he had Chicago Leafs and uh, ended up with Canadians. The team was so good. This is a true story. A lot of people don't know this is that they, they had a power play. Uh, they had a two-minute power play, and they went two minutes, and they'd score goals and goals and goals. They changed the rules. And the rule, as you know, is you score one goal, the power play is over. He, he's, uh, Dick is on. Now, when he talks, and he does talk a lot about hockey, he's a hockey guy. He used to be on when four years old. He used to be on the bench with all the Rockets and, and all those greats. So we have... Uh, Dick Irvin, and, um, and he was with Danny Galvin, two of the greatest. I remember I used to be on with them. We, uh, I'd be uh, up, upstairs with Danny doing the color, go down and do Coach's Corner with Dick Irvin. He, they were poetry in motion. They were the best. Let's go. Nice. But first of all, we have Hall of Famer referee, Red Story. Hey! hey Red. What a guy! 76. All right. We're going to talk a little bit about his book, Dick Irvin's book. Not a bad looking book. I'm right there. See that? You were younger then. I know. See. <laughs> My hair was brown. Yeah. <laughs> that was before Harry Sinden. All right. Now look, let me ask you a question. Right off the bat, we got to get Harry Watson. You saw Harry play. Now, I'll tell you a story about Harry. I, I talked to the old players back there from Toronto. When Barucco scored that overtime, that great goal against Jerry McNeil, the, old guy, the guys tell me that played on that team. I mean old guys. What am I talking about? The guys tell me that Harry Watson was the guy that saved the goal that was going in. He was the guy that the coach put on to score a goal and keep it out. Tell us about Harry Watson. Oh. Not in the Hall of Fame. Five Stanley Cups. Go ahead, Red. Oh, Harry was probably the best left winger that ever played for Toronto. And he was the nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. A real nice guy. So. And they used to say, all of the other coaches used to say, don't wake him up or he'll kill us. And that's the truth. If you got him mad, he'd wipe out your whole team and get a couple of winning goals on top of it. Yeah, he, he was something else. He played about 20 years, too. How come he's not? I, I was surprised when you came out on that and said he wasn't in the Hall right. of Fame. He should have been in there 10, 15 years ago. Well, you know, and if somebody out there has got to start pu pumping the drum for this well, guy. Let's because start right we're, here. We're starting right now, folks. Harry Watson, I know you never saw him play. Gary Bettman, go down the stage here. Down the stage. Not anything. Red. Fighting in the game, what do you think? Love it, under one condition. What? You don't drop the gloves. Oh. Because nobody... Who, are you tough? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Hey, I didn't win all mine either, you know. <laughs> yeah, I could see that red. I, I, didn't, I didn't get this face in my own business either. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, in the old days, when they fought, they dropped the gloves and they fought. They didn't grab sweaters and have a waltz and, and all that garbage. And they didn't break their hand on a big plastic helmet. They fought and it was over. And you let them go. Let them fight till they were tired. They wouldn't bother you the rest of the night. But now they get out there and they waltz and all this stuff. I would allow fighting in the game. One condition, you keep the gloves on. And if you drop them, you're out of the game. And if you want to fight, go fight. Because if I'm refereeing and you want to fight, you go right ahead. I'm going to enjoy this too. Yeah. You know the three words? I don't know. I don't know, Red. I don't know. Anyhow, you know the three words I hated to hear when I was going in the fight? Let them go. Oh, no. I don't want to go. I'll tell you like that. Hey, and I'll tell you something else. I have never seen a team in my life with more than two tough guys on it. Take off the helmets and you'll find out it's a very clean game. There you are. I like you. I've been saying this all along. Now, we got to go to Dick in his great book. we got to go to Dick. Who's the best hockey player you ever saw? Bobby Orr. I like it. Right there. In front of there. You agree? And now here he is, ladies and gentlemen, my buddy from Hockey Night in Canada, Dick Irvin. Come on in, Dick. Come on there, Dick. We're going to talk about the thing. Don't you go away. Be right back with Dick.
Yeah, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Spread CA, uh, First Nations owned by online casino and sports, and all for Can- You know, they're Canadians too. I like, uh, I like it's, it's for Canada. Uh, now, you know, they have some great incentives. That, you know, everybody likes to, and when you're, if you're going to uh, um, bet, and if you see a game, I don't care who it is, if you got the money on the line, you, you really feel good. Now, they, uh, they have some great things. Um, you sign up now, you enter pro, you promo, and the word is grapes. I must tell how I got that name, Grape, sometime. And they will match your deposit of 100% up to 500 bucks. That's pretty good. I mean, if you're going to bet, that sounds pretty good to me. Uh, 15 free spins on the big wheel, and you get big, some big dough. And $25 for free sports bet. That to start with. And um, spread CA. I think it should be in the Canadian. And I like the money. It's staying in Canada anyhow. The re- I'm not knocking the rest of them, but the rest of them are usually American. So don't forget, spread CA, First Nations own uh, online casino and sports back for Canadians. All right? I know. I, I, right off the bat, I want to ask you a question. Normie Dusso, your dad said, whoever gets a winning goal, I, I know I'm throwing a curve to everybody, but tell us about what your dad did there. Remember that? Playing in Toronto, and it was a tight game and a tight race for first place or whatever. And at the end of the second period, my father said to the guys in the room, somebody scores a winning goal tonight, I'll pay him $100. So a little guy named Normie Dusso, about five foot six, he drills one right past Turk Broda, top shelf. They win the game two to one, so he forks out. There was a picture in the Toronto Telegram, my dad peeling off a hundred bucks. He was in trouble with the league, they were going to investigate him, and this and that, but Normie kept a hundred, I tell yeah, you. Yeah, right off the bat. <laughs> 26 years, consecutive years, he, 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 that's unbelievable, he coached, I mean. Guys today say, how long did your father coach in the NHL? I say, 26 years, and they look at me. They're hoping to last 26 weeks. You know, and it, but it was quite a record, Don. I'm very Gee. proud of it. Uh, certainly, he coached in a different era, of course. And, Pressure uh, was just the same. Of course Maybe it was. was. Of course I mean, it was. Unbelievable. Uh, you know, he went. Uh, hey, six teams, uh, seven teams with the Americans. Different altogether. But uh, I'm proud of what he did, and he's in the Hall of Fame. I guess so. He fooled you a few times. Hey, eh? uh, you figure after a loss, you're, he's going to. But he fooled you a few I'm times. I'm going to ask. I'm going to throw this back at you. My father would come home after a tough loss. And we would, I mean, he was a bad loser, too, I think, too much so, I think. He would fall asleep in five minutes like a baby. They'd win, he couldn't go to sleep. He'd be all excited and walking. I would have thought it would have been the other way around. Jerry Cheevers told me the same thing from my book. He said, I used to go home and have a couple of beers, sandwich, I couldn't go to sleep when we'd win. Same with my dad, except with him it was tea, because he was a teetotaler. He said, what about you? How did you react to that? Well, I had more than a couple of beers. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but, but really, though. That, that, no, I, I, I used to go home. And then people laugh, and everybody had uh, blue. When I'd be in Boston, I used to uh, go for a walk with blue. Yeah. Honest to God, and then okay. I used to, uh, and I get. I was really pumped up, and 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 you had the writers in Montreal. Your dad had the right in Boston. They had every small city around there had to have a thing. So you had. We had a 25-mile drive. So I was kind of cooled down. The inside would be all, you know, <laughs> fogged up and and everything like that. But I used to have three or four pints and. Put me to bed. Let me read you this. Don says he's on the front cover, which he is. He's also on the back cover of the book. And this is a quote, one of the many great quotes that Don gave me for the book. But listen to this. This is Don. Now think of our friend the coach standing in front of the Bruins at the start of the season at training camp. He says, when we would go to training camp, I used to tell the players we were taking off on a long voyage and I was their commander. Lord Nelson, I'd say, some of you are going to be here for the long voyage. But some of you, if you don't produce, it'll be like a ship on a foggy night. You'll be dropped over the side, and nobody will know you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> I love that part. <laughs> that used to scare him right off the yeah, bat, I'll tell so. you. Till of the Hun, that's another one. His first, his first year, he said he was Mickey Mouse, and he's paid the price. They were lousy in the playoffs. They got blown out. So he said, Don said, the next year when I show up at camp, Attila the Hun. You better believe it. Yeah. I was Genghis Khan, too, I think. (laughs) But two guys that really changed the rules in this game, and a lot of people don't realize they see it now, you know, Mighty Ducks and all that stuff. One was Lester Patrick. He really, he changed a lot of rules. Tell us first about him. Yeah, it's interesting. They go back to these fellows who were, I did some research for, I have a chapter in the book called Some of the Old Timers. For example, numbers in the backs of uniforms. Never in any sport didn't have them. Lester and his brother went to England, saw them do that in soccer, changed the rules. First rushing defenseman when he played. Defenseman never, Lester Patrick. Goaltenders used to get a penalty if they dropped to the ice. Lester Patrick had them change that rule. These guys are innovators. Art Ross is the other one, right? right? Ross, you yeah. know, he, he invented the puck that they use today, invented the net that they use today. 
I think he invented, he might have had something to do with the, the guards in the back of the yeah, skate. Uh, the, uh, you know, like Achilles tendon thing. So, I'd say our chilies, but I don't know how to say it. So yeah. <laughs> These old timer guys, but there's something about the old timers that I found, and I found myself thinking about you. In the 20s, well, already the 30s and the 40s, there were four guys who were coaching all the time. There was Art Ross in Boston, Lester Patrick in New York, Jack Adams in Detroit, and Irvin in either Toronto or Montreal. Now think about this. They saw each other every single season for 20 years. And they would play against each other, not like today, two times yeah. a year or something. They hated each other. They got to literally hate each other. And we saw a little bit of it last year with Burns and, and Melrose yeah. in the playoffs because they were seeing each other every night. But how can you get mad? How could you get mad at Scotty Bowman if you played him once in October and once in March? Oh, if I hated Scotty. I yeah, played no, him no, in no, the playoffs. I got to rise it. But, you know, that's the difference today. Yeah. And those guys, Lester Patrick, in the old Madison Square Garden, they had a lot of hockey pictures up. My father was in a couple of them. And one night in Toronto, when my dad was coaching the Leafs, they went like this, nose to nose. They both had good-sized noses, too. Yeah. And, and <laughs> they, they really went at each other, and they had to be broken up. They, now Patrick goes back to New York, and he has all the pictures of my father taken down off the walls of Madison Square yeah. Garden, and they never... Those guys didn't like each I other. I know. Well, that's the, the intensity of the game. Told Blake, talk about an intensive guy. Boy, yeah. what a coach he was. Yeah. He was tough. The famous plane ride story. I can't use the complete language here, but the Canadians played, it was the last year as a coach, and they played in Oakland, California, and they lost the game to the mighty Oakland Seals. They're not supposed to do that, but they lose. Now they fly to LA, it's a terrible flight. It's bumpy, and people are ill on the plane and everything else, and Toe is at the, waiting for the luggage now, it's two o'clock in the morning in the LA airport. And one of the Montreal writers decides, I'll go over and Toe stand. Nobody's talking to him, his hat's down, he's looking at the floor, because he was a terrible loser. And he said, well, coach, uh, pretty rough flight, eh? And he says, I wish the bleeping thing had crashed. <laughs> oh, now that's tough. I remember we <laughs> and were... And the players hear this, oh, <laughs> yeah. God. I remember we were flying in. We couldn't land. We were flying from uh, forget where, and we couldn't land in Boston, so we had to land in Hartford. It was awful. And we, we really thought we were, this is it. We're taking the... I says, well, it's okay, guys. We're all sitting in the back. If we go down, we go down in first spot. And Milbury said back to me, he says, yeah, with a game on hand. <laughs> now, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's great. Now, Milbury, Milbury, kind of a wild coach. Mike Milbury was with the Bruins too, eh? I didn't like it when I asked him. I said, Mike, did you lose it some nights behind the bench? Ooh, I'm having a nice conversation with this guy, and suddenly there's ice coming between his eyes and my eyes, you see. But yeah, he, he, was, uh, he let it get to him, and he said something. He quit coaching because he said it was too much of an effect on his family life, and he said, ask Rose. She'll tell you what it was like around the Cherry household. And I can relate to that around our household. When my dad used to come home after a game, they'd go home on the train after losing in New York or Boston some night, we wished he'd go right to the office. We didn't even want to see him at the house. Unfortunately, he used to come home uh, all the time. Yeah. But I don't know why, because he would never talk to us for about... I'm telling you, he would not talk to his family. Yeah, I, I, I resented a little bit what he put in, the paper, uh, in your book there. I mean, the, and he said that uh, Rose didn't enjoy life and the kids didn't enjoy life because I was a career coach, you know, for all the time. But he was wrong, and I'll tell you why. I got Timothy involved when he was in. He could hardly wait to get to the rink. Cindy was involved in Rochester. She used to be down there helping in the office and everything like that. I don't know if Rose had a happy life, but I mean... Uh, <laughs> That's what he said to me, ask Rose. Yeah. Well, well I'll have, we'll have to ask her sometime. Uh, Jerry Cheevers now. He was another guy... I coach. Geez, I'm a pretty good coach, all these guys. Jerry Cheevers. <laughs> Jerry Cheevers is probably the only guy in the National Hockey League's history who coached his first game with his goalie pads on. He's told That's me the right. story. That's true story. Yeah. Minnesota, afternoon game, and he's coaching, and he gets thrown out with about 10 minutes to go. Dwight Foster, I said, if that son of a gun, Greg Medill was the coach, I says, if he Correct. gives him a penalty, I'm not finishing this game. And you got a penalty? Did he ever? And, and I won. didn't finish the game. So go ahead. So Cheevers, is, and, they're, and they're going for a shutout. There's a rookie goalie called Seaweed. Yeah, uh, Jimmy Petty. That's right. And so they're going for this shutout. And so he said, I played all the defensive guys for the last 10 minutes, and they got the shutout. And they went 5 nothing. He said he went into your office after, put the big pads up, but let out the cigar yeah. and the whole bit. You know? I walked in. But now they go to Chicago, and Petty is a kind of a party guy, and he treats the boys on the plane. He treats the boys when you get to Chicago. You start Cheevers the next afternoon. He gets about 55 shots on him because he's playing behind a bunch of guys with hangover. Yeah. He, said, he said, I got him the shutout, and now I paid the price. Uh, he always played bad in Chicago anyhow. <laughs> now, Freddie Sherrill the Fog. I love the question he asked uh, Hound Dog Kelly. Yeah, I, I got to get this right. He said uh, he's got the players gathered around him on the ice one morning. He says to Hound Dog Kelly, what did you have for breakfast this morning? He was trying to, to talk about commitment to the team. And he says, I had ham and eggs. Well, he says, remember this. He says, the chicken made a contribution, but the pig made a commitment. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> Now, Glenn Sather, another guy. That was a good one. Glenn Sather. 
Here's another guy that was a uh, pretty uh, determined guy. Well, I asked Glenn, I tried to vary the questions to the coaches, and, and I asked Glenn, what was it like to coach Wayne Gretzky? I mean, you think about it. Here's the greatest guy, getting 200 points. I mean, that must have been really something. And Glenn was good. He said that, that he, he watched Wayne Gretzky develop like you'd watch one of your own kids. He, you know, from the very beginning, he said, Wayne never got any special treatment. Oh, he went, had to go to all the meetings and all that. He was pretty good. But the one thing that, that, that Glenn said was he liked the competition of coaching. He loved coaching against Bob Johnson. He loved coaching against Scotty Bowman, against Mike Keenan. I think that's something that the fans forget a little bit, Don, that there is a competitiveness yep. to the coaching aspect of it that we perhaps don't pay enough attention to, you know, television guys, fans. And that's the thing that got me about Sather. He's a competitive guy. Well, I, I remember in the book it says that uh, he didn't treat Gretzky any different. He didn't. He no. practiced everybody. And it was the same thing with Bobby Orr. This is a true story. I used to come in and just rip guys. This here, this guy, I swear to God, Bobby come to me after a while, he says, look, Don, when you're giving the guys heck, could you give me heck too? I'll tell you, it was tough finding something, but I finally <laughs> made it. So, hey, you just remind me, I'd like to break in here with a story. I know it's your show. Hey, every show I'm on is his show. What's, yeah, the, what's the difference, ahead, you know? Ahead. It's the same thing. But you, you referred to Bobby Orr as your secretary when you were coaching. That's right. All right, That's let right. me go back to the early 1950s. And you remember the National Hockey League teams never played each other in exhibition games. They always played American League teams, yeah. Senior League teams. And the Canadians are the Stanley Cup champs in 53, and they're playing in September in Valley Field, which is about 40 miles outside Montreal. They had a fine senior hockey team that just won the Edinburgh Cup or whatever. Toe Blake was the coach. Yeah. Exhibition game Sunday afternoon. The Rocket is my dad's secretary. You know that. Yeah, There's no question sure. about that. He's got a nagging injury. Something's wrong with him. He's not feeling so hot, and it's kind of working on him. So at the end of the second period, my dad said, as you probably would, okay, that's it, take the rest of the day off because I don't want to take a chance. Rocket changes into civvies, he goes up into the seats. He can't find a place, it's sold out, standing room only, so he's up in the seats, the top of the standing room. And the guys are giving it to him pretty good, son. Hey, what's the matter, Rocket? You're too good to play in Valley Field, and you know, we're in a too small town for you, and all this. And one guy in particular gets very, very up close and personal with this. Push leads the shove, and the Rocket lets him have it. Knocks the guy down the stairs, he is out cold. Best one-punch fighter in the history of the NHL, yeah. I've always said that. Yeah. So anyway, here's this, now the police jump in, the fans, the players look up, and they say, ooh, Rocket's in trouble. Up they go into your typical Sunday afternoon at a hockey rink. You know, hey, that's what I call that's hockey, yeah. right, yeah. Now, now, part two. About three or four days later, I'm at a baseball game with my dad. The old Montreal Royals are playing the International League, and Toe Blake is at the game, and he comes over and sits down. My father says, what about that guy that the rocket hit on Sunday? Is he going to sue us? He said, sue you? He said, he's the happiest guy in town. He's walking around, up and down the main street, pointing to his black eye, saying, look what the rocket gave me. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty. Hey, listen now. Al McNeil had to have the strangest coaching <laughs> career of all time. Tell us about Al McNeil. Al McNeil, I think I'm right in this, is the only coach who ever won a Stanley Cup and started the next year in the minor leagues. In 1971, he took over from Claude Ruel in December, and that was the year that he started in the playoffs. It's a, a young goalie by the name of Ken Dryden, who used to say Ken who, Start, played in six games in the regular season. They open up against Boston. The Bruins have set all kinds of records. Espo, Bobby, they open up in Boston and Ken Dryden's in the Nets and they win the series. Make a long story short, they win the Stanley Cup and Henry Richard was benched in one of the games, didn't play much in one of the games in Chicago in the finals. And after the game, he's really mad. He said, Al McNeil's the worst coach I ever played for in my life. It's in the papers in Montreal. There's an English argument, French argument. It was an awful mess. He was in Halifax. And uh, Henry scores the two goals to win the, win the Stanley Cup. Al McNeil's coach in 1971. When the season starts, the next Next year, Scotty Bowman's coaching the Canadians and Al McNeil's in Halifax. But he said that he told me for the book that it was his idea. He went to Sam Pollock and said, look, this isn't going to work. There's too much pressure on me. The language thing was a problem. He's from Halifax. That's right, yeah. And he went down. He was a very good company man. He, Al did a great job and finally got back in the NHL with the Flames and coached them. Yeah, and he's still there now. A good yeah. guy. Pat Quinn. You know, of all the guys that I've met in hockey and all everybody, I think Howie Meeker said it the best, everybody in hockey, well, not everybody now, but they're great people in that's hockey. That's right, people. exactly. That's what he I said. Pat Quinn is the least affected of any guy. I, he's the same guy. He played for Tulsa, and I, had, I, I was in, and he came to Rochester, and I took him on my wing. I said, come on, kid, we go to a party, we get a six-pack, the whole deal. Now, he's the least affected of any guy. What a guy Pat Quinn is. You know, it's funny, Don, you mentioned that, because talking to a lot of the younger coaches in particular, John Paddock I can think of in Winnipeg, and two or three others that I talked to for the book, the one guy that they said influenced their career, Pat Quinn. They had played for him or, you know, had studied his ways. He's a very, very influential guy in hockey, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, like when you talk to him, you know, he's coach of the year and stuff like that. Uh, next to me, 
Who told you the best story? You're the best storyteller. Well, I'm not going to say. Me. Yeah, I'm not going to say. Some there are storytellers like the Don Cherries, the Emil Francis's, the Harry Neals, a little more serious guys like Mike Keenan and Scotty Bowman and so on. I just had a great time talking to them all. But you're the best. There's no question. Well, that's for sure. Yeah. That's like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gee, now, we had a strange one with Roger, eh? Like uh, Roger. Nielsen, a kind of a strange interview with Roger. Well, Roger, I saw Roger in the middle of December in New York. He's coaching the Rangers. I said, Roger, I'm writing a book about coaching. Oh, good, that's a good idea. He said, about time somebody wrote a book. He said, you're coming to Montreal on the 16th of January. Let's get together. No problem. We'll have lunch, whatever. But he gets fired on the 4th of January, so he doesn't show up. <laughs> so one of my coaches got fired, you know? So anyway, I did the interview with Roger on the phone, and it's not easy to talk to a guy a few days after he loses a yeah, job. Look, and Roger's been around. I mean, he's, dog you know. died, too, though. Exactly. Was, boy, I'll and, tell you. No, no really. No, hold it. Funny. Hold it. That's not that's not a that's no, not that's a funny, not funny story. Not the at guy, all. Dog dies yep. and you laugh. His dog Mike went with him for all Smack the places him, that he went. <laughs> and but uh, no, Roger was good, and he was. Uh, he had. I had him tell the story about with the paper bag over his head with Harold Ballard. It's what too long. It's too long to tell now. Well, no, tell, give it just a quick one on that. Well, you know, Ballard. They didn't have a coach. This was the funny part of it. He fired him on television in Montreal on a Thursday night. They go back, but they don't hire anybody else. And he, Roger has to hold his own news conference in Toronto to announce he's been fired because the Leaf management don't come down. They can't find anybody. Ballard comes down. He says to get his toes, toenails cut by the trainer Ooh. on Friday night. And and <laughs> well, that's what he said. And Roger's hanging around the gardens. And Ballard said, what are you doing this weekend? Nothing. Well, you better hang around, which means you're going to be rehired. Now he wants the car there. Now, who's going to coach the Leafs? It's in all the papers. Nobody knows. He wants Roger to walk out with a paper bag over his head. The unknown coach, you know, like the unknown <laughs> comedian, you know. And Roger was going to do it. But he got the, at the last minute, he said no. But he sort of walked in when they played the national anthem, and the place went nuts. Yeah, I was there. I went, you really went crazy. Uh, one last thing. Uh, a whipping boys. Everybody has whipping boys, right? Yeah, not, well, I don't know about everybody, but uh, they do. It seems to me that there has to be somebody, and you had yours yeah. in Boston. Yeah. You know, Bowman had Rick Chartrand, Pete Mahovlich in Montreal, and I guess there's a lot of others. I had Peter McNabb and, and Bobby Miller. You better explain what we mean now. That's the guy that the coach is always on their back, and if he wants to get a message across to the Bobby Orrs of life, but doesn't want to talk to him directly, he goes after another guy. I'll tell you a story about Bobby Miller. I was always on him. One time, the, the Americans call you coach all the time, eh? Canadians just call you grapes or something like that. So he says, uh, what are we going to do uh, now, coach? I says, I'll tell you, player. So that was the end of that. But I got, I got one little question. Wait a minute, I got one little, little story about Bobby Miller. He went out and got a tan in the playoffs. Now, you know, if you see people see people on television, the hockey players, Gretzky and all them, they all look white. They all have coals. It's a mark of honor that you don't get a tan. So he was he was American, kid. You he want was the blue the veins to show Yeah, you want face. veins and you want to look mean. <laughs> So he goes out and gets a tan. So now we're going out to LA, you know, flying out. And Cash says, oh boy, look at, look at Miller. So he's all tan. I go back to the plane. I said, what are you doing with that tan? He said, well, geez, Grapes, I didn't know you're not supposed to. He says, I said, he says, well, what do you want me to do with it? I said, get rid of it. <laughs> Think about it. Think about Think it. About he's got to get rid of it. Yeah. He'll be right back with Jack Brown right. right there, I'll tell you. All right, wait, you just, you just mentioned Wayne Cashman's name, and that reminded me of one of my favorite stories in the book. And you'll remember this. Wayne Cash is telling me about the time when Don was coaching him in Boston. And these, the team's not going so hot, and they go off on the big trip to the West, and Grapes is a little down on them, so you give them the silent treatment. That's right. You won't talk to them in the bars. You won't talk to them in the restaurant, in the dressing room, before the game, after the game. And he's got 20 guys all scared they're going to get sent to the minor leagues. And you win a game in L.A., and you win a game in Oakland, and you win the game in Vancouver. And now you still haven't talked to anybody. And you wa he walks around the corner in Vancouver there looking for a beer, and there you are sitting there, and you're saying, hey, it worked, they cash. We didn't lose a game. He said, and he said to me, he was a sports psychologist before they ever had sports psychologists. There you are, folks. Hey. What did I tell you? <laughs> I'll tell you what happened there. There's a, there's a funny one. There's a funny one. In fact, I told Cash to take the guys to the bar night before yeah. a game, and I walked in and caught them and let on I was mad. Anyhow, put it okay, there, Greg Boy! Put it there, Greg right. Boy! Do my Greg Buddies. Were they easy shows or what, folks? See you next week, folks. See you next week. You know, I have to tell you a story about, as we end here, I have to tell you a story about Dick, and this, this is a true story. He had a lovely wife named Wilma, and, um, and, and, and she just hated fights in, in hockey. 
I guess a lot of people don't like fights, but she'd get so upset if there was a fight. And it was Quebec and, um, and Montreal, and boy, it was a fight to fight, end all fights. And um, it went on and on and on. And I, I happened to be in the, I was in the other dress room, and I was just doing Coach's Corner, and I was sitting with three Quebec, Quebec guys, and we were watching. And, you know, they, hey, what a great fight. They, the, the hockey players are saying, what a great fight, Dad. And, and it went on and on and on. And it came back, and, and then they went in the dressing room, they come out again, and guys were suspended. Bruce Hood was the referee. It was the last one he ever did. So I went out in the hall, and, he, and Eric, Eric Stastny, I think it was coming off, and one of the Stastny's coming off, and his nose was really, really smashed. Anyhow, to me, it, it was a good fight. And she was so upset. She was so upset that she sold Dick. She says, you're taking me home. So what I, I had, uh, Ralph Mellenby was the boss as, as usual. You go up and do the color with uh, Bob Cole. So I went up and did the color with Bob Cole. And it's all because <laughs> Wilma was so upset and Dick had to go home with her and take her home. That was just one of the little stories we had. And we had a lot of fun. And when I was with, with Danny, when I did the color boy, as I said earlier, it was poetry in motion. <laughs>